Um, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, whichever is appropriate for your time zone. Um, we still have people gently joining us, but I think I can start in with my introduction so that we don't get started too late. Um, this is Denise Gabuzda at University College Cork. I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of the organizing committee to this third in a series of seminars focusing on high resolution radio astronomy, the sharpest view of the radio universe VLBI Connecting Astronomers Worldwide. We're planning a total of seven seminars for the period between um, when we started up to the time of the next European VLBI Network Symposium, which um, it was hoped to, to hold July 12th to 16th, 2021 in Cork, Ireland. But that of course is COVID permitting and um, everything is still uncertain at the moment. I want to mention just a few logistics of the way this will, webinar will be run. You'll all be muted throughout the presentation, but you're invited to type in any questions you may have for our speaker through the question and answer facility. You can send in questions both during and after the presentations, but questions will be answered only after the presentation is finished. Please try to write your questions clearly and keep them short. We'll aim to get to as many of your questions as we can, and we apologize in advance if your question is not among those we have time to answer today. I'd now like to invite Benito Marcote to introduce today's speaker, Kenzie Nimo from University of Amsterdam. Hi everyone, and thank you all for joining in this seminar. It is my pleasure to introduce Kenzie Nimo as our speaker today. So Kenzie did her studies at the University of Glasgow in Scotland, where she also did the master uh, while working on Bayesian modeling of neutron and star crust, shattering gravitational waves. Uh, during that time, she also did several internships at different locations, such as the High Altitude Observatory in Boulder, Colorado, or the Monash University in Melbourne. And in this time, she worked on different topics, ranging from solar flare simulations to spin down of milliseconds magnet, millisecond magnetars. And currently she is doing the PhD at the Anton Panikuk Institute at the University of Amsterdam and Astron in Duingelo. And now she is mainly involved in the study of fast radio bursts and also the radio transient events using both single disk and VLBI observations. And this is what she's going to talk in this seminar. So, can see the floor is all yours. Thanks, Benito. Um, hi, yeah, I'm Kenzie. Uh, I've just finished my second year of my PhD at uh, the University of Amsterdam and Astron. And uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk today on fast radio bursts with the European VOBI network. Um, so I'll get straight into it. Uh, fast radio bursts were first discovered in 2007. They were discovered by Duncan Lorimer uh, and collaborators, which is why the, the original burst is called the Lorimer burst. And it was discovered by looking through archival pulsar data with, with the Parkes uh, radio telescope back in 2001. Um, and here, the, this plot I'm showing is frequency on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. We call this a dynamic spectrum. And you can see the signal is swept from high frequencies to low frequencies. And this is an effect called dispersion. When the radio wave interacts with electrons, it causes a delay between when the frequencies arrive. Um, and so the amount of delay depends on the number of electrons that the signal interacts with. Um, and this can be quantified using the dispersion measure, which is the integrated column density of electrons between us and the source. To correct for dispersion, uh, we pick a reference frequency. So here I've picked the top of the frequency band and we take each frequency and we shift it with respect to this this reference frequency so we're essentially lining up all of the signal into this green bar once we've removed the effect of dispersion we can create this uh, inset plot which is the burst profile and so you you sum across frequencies after you've removed the effect of dispersion and you get the burst profile uh, as a function of time um, so dispersion uh, if you if you have more electrons uh, you have a higher dispersion measure so 
Um, dispersion can kind of be used as a proxy for distance in the sense that if it's traveled farther, it's interacted with more, uh, with more electrons, and so the dispersion measure will be higher. And we, we see dispersion in pulsars, um, and pulsars are used to map the electron content in the Milky Way. And uh, so there's models for how much dispersion we expect from uh, Milky Way per line of sight. And what was interesting about uh, the Lorimer burst is that the amount of dispersion in this line of sight was much less than the total dispersion of dispersion measure of this um, of this burst. So this implies that it's coming from a much larger distance. Uh, but this burst was, was extremely bright. And so if you compare this brightness, if you convert the brightness to an energy, um, uh, assuming this extra galactic distance, uh, this implies a, a extremely large energy comparable to gamma ray bursts and supernovae. And so there was a period of time where, where people were skeptical about whether or not this was a real astrophysical transient. Um, but now we've seen hundreds of fast radio bursts and we've even localized some to host galaxies. So we know that these are real uh, and we know that they're extra galactic. And so a general description of fast radio bursts. Uh, they are extremely bright, short duration, uh, coherent radio flashes, um, typically a few milliseconds in duration. They come from very large distances. Um, we know that they're extra galactic. And uh, some FRBs have been observed to repeat. And by what I mean by that is that they, um, they produce multiple bursts, but not necessarily periodic, not like a pulsar with one burst every rotation uh, of the object. It's more um, clustered, so we have periods of activity and periods of inactivity. Um, and during an active period, we can have uh, yeah, one, two, hundreds uh, of bursts. Um, we also have seen a lot of the, the population that have only produced one burst. Uh, so we call them non-repeating FRBs. It's unclear at this point whether there are uh, multiple populations of fast radio bursts, if there are repeating and non-repeating FRBs, or if they're all the same thing and the non-repeating FRBs are just um, less active than the repeaters. Um, ultimately, we, we don't know what causes fast radio, what produces fast radio bursts. The, the progenitor is unknown and the emission physics is also unknown. But there are, are a larger number of uh, models for what FRBs could be produced by. Uh, I show some on the screen now. Most of them involve some type of compact object like a neutron star or black hole. Um, I mentioned that some FRBs uh, repeat. So some of these cataclysmic models, they can't describe all of the, uh, all of the population of fast radio bursts because we have to have some kind of long lived engine to be able to produce multiple bursts spanning months and years. Uh, there are also some, some exotic models on here, like flare stars, uh, yeah, aliens, who knows. Uh, but the most pr promising model, um, progenitor model for FRBs is uh, magnetars or neutron stars. So magnetars are, are highly magnetized neutron stars where their source of energy comes from the, the decay of the magnetic field, as opposed to uh, like rotational spin down energy or accretion. And because they have such a strong magnetic field, it means they have a huge energy budget, which is exactly what you need if we want to produce these very high energy uh, radio flashes. Um, and the, the added bonus is that we know a handful of magnetars in our own galaxy that can produce coherent radio emission. Um, there are a number of unanswered questions about FRBs that I've, that I've outlined, repeating, non-repeating, um, uh, what causes them, uh, but looking at the bigger picture and the future prospects for FRB science, FRBs have a number of very interesting applications. Um, they can be used to solve the missing baryons problem. And there's already a, a paper uh, by uh, JP McCart on, uh, uh, that's, that's published um, that, that tackles this missing baryons problem. And essentially what this is, is that there's a discrepancy between um, theoretical predictions and experiments um, and there's a fraction of the baryons in the universe that, that are not detected. And with FRBs, we have the, the dispersion measure. And if we can localize these FRBs and have no redshifts, then we can use this relationship to essentially map the baryons in the universe and account for these missing baryons. Uh, we can look at the polarization properties of FRBs to study the magnetic field in the intergalactic medium and in other galaxies. Um, we can also use this DMZ, the McCart relation, um, so dispersion measure as a function of redshift, to constrain the cosmological parameters, including the, the Hubble constant. 
And if we have one example of a repeating fast radio burst that is gravitationally lensed, then we can use the time delay between the images of this gravitationally lensed uh, FRB uh, and, and watch the evolution of this time delay, which essentially is watching the evolution of uh, the redshift. And so you're measuring the expansion of the universe in real time. So now I've given you some context on fast radio bursts and the field and the, um, uh, the applications of fast radio bursts. I, I want to tell you about what we can learn about fast radio bursts using the European VLBI network. There's three, three advantages to the EVN that I'm going to talk about today. The first is high precision localization. The second is high cadence monitoring. And the third is high precision burst characterization. So first, I'm going to talk about high precision localization with the EVN. Uh, studying the host galaxies and the local environments can unveil clues about the progenitor of fast radio bursts and if there are multiple populations, uh, such as repeating and non-repeating. Um, as I mentioned a few slides ago about this uh, future prospects idea, we, we want to have a lot of FRBs that are localized so that we can populate this DMZ uh, uh, distribution. So localizing FRBs is extremely important. And there's telescopes such as ASCAP, DSA-10 and VLA that can uh, localize FRBs to about arc second precision. And in some cases, even a 10th of an arc second. Um, and some of the examples I've shown on screen here, uh, you can see that the, the position is usually uh, a circle or an ellipse. This is the, the positional uncertainty of the, of the localization. And then you can see the galaxy in the image behind. Uh, also overplotted is the, the redshift. Um, so you can see that these, these FRBs are extremely, extremely far away. Um, so arc second precision localization is, um, is great for identifying the host galaxy. But if we really want to zoom in on the source and study the local environment, we need to go to milli arc second resolution. So now I want to introduce uh, FRB 12.1102. FRB 12.1102 is the first repeating FRB that was discovered and consequently one of the best studied FRBs in the literature. Um, it also was the first FRB to be uh, localized to a host galaxy. So here we have a, a VLA image um, of the sky uh, at the position of FRB 12.1102, and the circles represent the error region from Arecibo bursts from this source. So this is the error region provided by Arecibo, and there's two bursts uh, that were detected. And over here is a VLA image of five milliseconds of data at the time of a burst. And you can see that the, um, the burst has been localized here to about 100 milli arc second resolution. Now that we know the position of 121102, uh, we go back to the, the VLA image and you can highlight this radio source uh, that appears quite close to the position of 121102. And this uh, panel B shows the optical image of the white box, um, where you can also see an optical counterpart. But with the EVM, we can really zoom in on this source. So this is the, the same source, 121102, with the EVM at 5 gigahertz. The grey crosses and the red cross are the four bursts that were detected in, as part of this uh, project. And the black cross is the signal-to-noise weighted average position of the four bursts. You can see that there's a, a radio source here in the in the center, this yellow uh, uh, source in the center of the image. Um, and with with the EVN, the location accurate, the localization accuracy increased from 100 milli arc seconds to 10 milli arc seconds. And also with the EVN, uh, we could constrain the size of the radio source to be less than 0.7 parsecs. And like the bursts themselves, this radio source, the physical origin is, is, not, um, is not known. So there's, there's two leading theories I'll, I'll briefly mention. One is potentially that you have a magnetar that's creating uh, radio bursts, um, that is FRB 121102, uh, that is embedded inside a dense nebula, which is the radio source. And the alternative theory is that uh, the FRB emitting source is a neutron star that is orbiting uh, an intermediate mass black hole. So now that we have this, this um, very precise position of 121102, um, we can look at the host galaxy. So this is a Hubble image uh, of, the, of the position of 121102. The position, the EVM position is shown by this white cross uh, and the host galaxy is here. This, this host galaxy is a low mass, low metallicity dwarf galaxy about a gigaparsec away. 
Um, and what's what's interesting about this type of host galaxy is that it's it's very similar to the hosts that um, superluminous supernovae and long gamma ray bursts also live in. Um, so that sparked a number of of theories that maybe uh, twelve eleven o two is related to these other uh, these other transients. The FRBs are related to these other transients. Um, you can also see that that it's very close to a star forming region inside this host galaxy. So this this environment is very distinct and uh, um, yeah very special. Um, and it was the first FRB to be localized. So um, obviously everyone was thinking this is really important for the fact that it's for the fact that it's an FRB. Um, but then following this, there was a few one-off non-repeating FRBs that were localized and they were found in comparatively uh, massive galaxies. They were found in much larger galaxies and they didn't really show much star formation. Um, and so then this, this kind of started the divide of, okay, maybe uh, 121102 is a repeating FRB and repeating FRBs are related to um, superluminous supernovae and long gamma ray bursts, whereas uh, these non-repeaters are, are something else and they live in other types of environments. But obviously it's hard to make these kind of conclusions given that you only have one repeating FRB localized. And for some time, 121102 was the uh, was the only known repeating FRB. And that was until CHIME uh, in Canada started to, to operate. Uh, and they've proven to be the world's best FRB finding machine. Uh, before CHIME began operating, we had 121102, that was the only repeater. Um, and then last year they published, I think, nine repeating FRBs. Uh, and then this year, again, they published another nine repeating FRBs. Um, but I'm only going to talk about one, uh, and that's FRB 2018-09-16B, or uh, 18-09-16, I'll probably call it. Um, this source was particularly interesting for a few reasons. One is that it was particularly active. It seemed to be bursting quite a lot, um, which is great because uh, to do FRB science, you need to have some FRBs. So it's great that it's producing bursts. Um, and the second is that it uh, appeared based on its dispersion measure. And I, I mentioned earlier that dispersion could be used as a proxy for distance. Based on the dispersion measure, it looked like it, it could have been, um, it could be really close. So it could be in a very nearby host galaxy or um, even within the, the halo of the Milky Way. And the localization that time provides is about three arc minutes. Um, which is insufficient to determine a, a specific host galaxy. So we started an EVN campaign um, at 1.7 gigahertz to target repeating fast radio bursts. Um, but first, before we can localize a fast radio burst, we have to find a fast radio burst. And so to do that, we use the most sensitive dish, um, which is the 100 meter Eccelsberg telescope. Uh, we use this, this dish um, to search for bursts. We can use SFXC, which is a software code for EVN correlation. We can use this to, to generate data from a single dish in order to search for bursts and also to uh, study the bursts in more detail um, uh, later on. And I'll talk about that later on in my talk. But for now, um, yeah, we need to search for bursts. SFXC can also be used to remove this effect of dispersion very accurately. Um, and on, on the 19th of June 2019, we detected four bursts from 1809-16. And this is what I show here. So uh, here we have the dynamic spectrum. So this is frequency as a function of time. Um, and on the top is the, the profile, uh, the burst profile. So this is when do you, uh, you sum in frequency. And in each of these, the dispersion correction has already been applied. So that's why the, the burst is very straight uh, in frequency. Um, and so this is burst B1, burst B2, burst B3, and burst B4. And you can see in, in each of the dynamic spectrum, you have some white lines. Um, and these are just the frequency channels that we've removed from the data, either due to radio frequency interference or some other artifact in the data that we wanted to get rid of. Um, also, there's this blue band, and this essentially just shows the, the uh, temporal extent of the burst. And then um, in burst three and burst four, there are some orange, purple, and green bars. Uh, and they are to, to identify some interesting temporal structure, but I'll talk about that later on. For now, all we need is the times of the bursts. So we know the times of each of these four bursts. Now we can go to the, to the EVN array. Uh, here we had eight telescopes participate in this project, and with this we can achieve milliarc second resolution. Um, so there are three steps to, to localizing an FRB. The first step is to find the bursts. So as I described, we take the single dish data, and we search for bursts. 
once we've found bursts and we know the times of the bursts, um, the, the positional accuracy from time that we have is about three arc minutes. So this is not, we can't image three arc minutes of data and, and localize the burst that way. We have to do an intermediate step where we use the time delay, um, which essentially manifests as uh, a phase, a slope in the phases along different baselines. If we use this delay between the EVM dishes to estimate the position of um, the, the position of the burst to about arc second accuracy, then once we have this um, uh, first step position, then we can make this our new phase center, recorrelate the data, and image the data. And this is exactly what what was done here, uh, and we image B one, B two, B three, and B four. Panel F shows the um, the positions of the four bursts. So the um, the orange points are the four bursts, and the black is the um, the signal to noise weighted average position of the four bursts. And with this, we could get accuracy of about two point three milli arc seconds. Now that we know the position uh, of eighteen oh nine sixteen, we can search for persistent emission because in, in the case of twelve eleven oh two, there was a persistent radio source. Um, so maybe we expect a persistent radio source here. And in panel E, this is the result of imaging the full data set at the, uh, at the position of 18 or 9, 16. And as you can see, we didn't detect any persistent radio emission down to the levels uh, that are shown on the screen. So we can interpret this non-detection uh, in a few different ways. Maybe in the case of, um, in the case of 12, 11, 02, the radio source was, was sort of a bit of a, a red herring in the sense that um, yeah, the radio source and the bursting source are very close to each other uh, spatially, but potentially they're just not at all related. They're just, they, they just live close to each other. Um, alternatively, uh, 180916 might just be a much older source than 121102. And so there is a radio source there, it's just uh, way too weak for us to detect. Okay, with this accurate position of 180916, we can look at the host galaxy. So this is a, an image that was made with Gemini North. And you can see that we found that 180916 is in the spiral arm of this uh, spiral galaxy, very similar to the Milky Way. Um, this galaxy is at a distance of 150 megaparsecs, which is a redshift of uh, 0.03. And um, yeah, if I compare with 121102, 121102 is at a distance of one gigaparsec. And um, some of these non-repeaters that I showed earlier, they were redshifts of uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, even higher. Um, so that's, yeah, comparable to one gigaparsec and above. Uh, so this is a very close fast radio burst. It's, it's in fact the closest FRB that has been localized to date. Um, and this, this host galaxy looks very different to 121102's host galaxy, which if you remember was a low mass, low metal dwarf galaxy. Um, this, this galaxy is much more like the Milky Way. It's a uh, hundred times more massive and it's um, it has a five times higher metallicity than the 121102 host. Um, also, you might have noticed that uh, FRB 180916, which is up here, is located right at the apex of this V-shaped star forming region. Um, so this is the, the zoom in here of the, the V-shaped star forming region with Gemini. And you can see that uh, the position of 180916 is right on the on the tip of this. Um, and actually the precision that we know, um, the position of 180916 with the EBN is better than the resolution of Gemini North. So we know the position better than one pixel uh, on this image. So we recently uh, observed with Hubble and we have a, an image of, of, the, of this V-shaped star forming region, region with Hubble here. And in fact, with Hubble, we have we have higher uh, higher resolution, and so we can see actually that 180916 is um, offset from the nearest star forming knot by about 400 parsecs. So this is really important for um, uh, for the age of the system. So there's a, a number of models that that expect the the FRB emitter to uh, be a very young active magnetar, but if it was a really young source, you would have probably expected it to be close to its birth site, i.e. inside this. Uh, the star forming region. And the fact that it's offset um, implies that, that maybe this, this system is actually older, um, but not so old that it's uh, much farther from the, from the star, form, form, star forming region. Uh, 
Um, so FRB 18.09.16's host uh, environment seems to be very different from 12.11.02. Uh, the host galaxies look look very different. And in fact, there's been a third uh, repeating fast radio burst that's been localized more recently. Um, so I've highlighted them here. This plot is the star formation rate as a function of mass uh, for galaxies so that you can see that divides into star forming galaxies and quiescent galaxies. Uh, we have 121102, which is this low mass, uh, low metallicity galaxy. We have 180916, which is a Milky Way like spiral galaxy. And then 190711 is in this massive star forming galaxy. Um, so the, these three galaxies seem to be very different. Um, and the diversity in the hosts of these repeating fast radio bursts, um, that has to be accommodated in a progenitor model. So either uh, FRBs can, pre can be produced by many different astrophysical objects uh, that, that live all over the universe, or um, they all come from the same kind of object, but that, that particular object can live in many different types of environments. Um, and I mentioned earlier about magnetars being a promising progenitor. Um, and in fact, magnetars can be formed by many different channels and as a result can live in many different environments. Uh, here I show two cases, so uh, superluminous supernovae and core collapse supernovae, both of which can create magnetars. The point I wanna make here is that the three repeaters don't really fall nicely into one of these boxes. Um, so this is highlighting the importance of really zooming in on the source and studying the local environment to, to be able to distinguish between these progenitor models. Okay, so now that I've told you about high precision localization with the EVN, uh, I'll move on to my second advantage, um, which is high cadence monitoring. Okay, so I've talked about magnetars. Uh, a little bit so far through my talk. I want to describe one source in particular. This is SGR 1935 plus 2154. Um, and it's been called the, the most burst prolific magnetar in our galaxy. Uh, and what is meant by that is that, that magnetars are known to produce uh, high energy X-ray bursts um, and they go into periods of activity and inactivity. Um, and during the active periods, they can just uh, uh, produce lots and lots of X-ray bursts back to back. Um, and this, this specific uh, magnetar is known to uh, go into outburst quite, quite frequently compared with other magnetars. And in April of this year, it, um, it went into outburst and it was um, very active in X-ray and high energy bursts producing lots and lots. And there was a bunch of ATELs um, detecting X-ray bursts from the source. And then on the 28th of April, uh, a bright radio burst was detected by uh, CHIME and also by stair two. So this, uh, this chime burst, you see that there's two components. This is the dynamic spectrum, frequency time, and the profile. Uh, it was detected with two components and it was simultaneously detected with this uh, 10 meter ARO dish. And uh, simultaneously stair two detected, uh, this, the chime detection was at 600 megahertz, stair two was at uh, 1.4 gigahertz. Um, and they simultaneously seen this, uh, only one component of this bright burst. And this represents the first time that radio emission has been seen from this magnetar. So that in itself is really exciting because we only know of a handful of magnetars that can produce radio emission. Uh, so having another one uh, is, is very exciting and interesting. But most importantly are uh, the fluencies. So uh, if you're not a radio astronomer, these might not make any sense. But um, to put into context, 700 kilojanski milliseconds and 1.5 megajanski milliseconds, this is orders of magnitude brighter than typical magnetar radio bursts. This is um, way brighter than anything we've seen, um, any kind of short duration radio transient we've seen in our galaxy. Also, uh, there was a simultaneous X-ray burst with the bright radio burst. It was detected with multiple, um, multiple instruments. Here I show the integral image, uh, the integral light curve. So this is the yeah, accounts and uh, time. And you can see the gray light curve with three peaks um, and the orange are the two radial peaks from uh, the Chime FRB burst. Um, and I, I mentioned in the previous slide that, um, that this particular magnetar was known for uh, going into outburst and producing X-ray bursts. Magnetars in general are known for producing X-ray and high energy bursts. But this particular event is, is um, somewhat atypical. So the, it's, the key is in the name, the, 
the name is SGR1935. SGR is a soft gamma ray repeater. Um, so soft. The bursts, the X-ray bursts are usually soft, which means most of the energy is at lower energies. This particular burst is much harder than typical SGR bursts. And in addition, normal um, uh, X-ray bursts from magnetars have a sharp rise in their morphology, have a sharp rise and a, a slow decay. But here you can see that there's, uh, there's three spikes. And this spike in morphology is, is very atypical for, for magnetar X-ray bursts also. So this event as a whole is very uh, uh, interesting and yeah, something that we've not really seen before. So I mentioned that this bright, uh, this bright burst was many orders of magnitude brighter than what we've seen from, from galactic objects. Uh, and this should uh, convince you of that. So here's a luminosity on the y-axis and transient duration on the x-axis. The green region is the, the region I kind of want to draw your attention to. Um, we have the, the population of, of pulsars shown in blue and the rotating radio transients in red. And we have some of the, the really high energy radio bursts uh, like crab nano shots and the, the giant pulses from pulsars uh, shown here. And then right at the top, we have the population of fast radio bursts. You can see that there, there is this big gap uh, between the two populations. And the burst from SGR 1935 sits right nice in this big gap. So it bridges the gap between these galactic uh, transients and fast radio bursts. Um, so potentially this is the, the first example of a galactic fast radio burst. And to further support this idea, if we were to place SGR 1935 at the distance of the closest uh, fast radio burst, which I've just spoken about, FRB 180916, at a distance of 150 megaparsecs, then we could detect this burst, uh, although it would have been very weak, we would have been, been able to detect this burst with um, the most sensitive telescopes such as RCBO and FAST. Talking about FAST, this is, uh, this is the FAST, the 500 meter FAST telescope in China. Um, a couple of days after the bright burst, FAST detected an extremely weak burst from SGR 1935. Um, this was 60 millijansky milliseconds, which is seven orders of magnitude weaker than the bright burst. Um, and it looks more like a typical magnetar radio burst. Now the plot here, again, this is the dynamic spectrum, so frequency, time. Uh, this is the profile. The black is the total intensity. The red is linear polarization and the blue is circular polarization. And on the top is the polarization position angle. So due to the recent activity of the source, we started to think how we can use the EVN to learn more about SGR 1935. Um, it seems that radio bursts from this source are, are pretty rare. Um, also, it was seen at 600 megahertz and at 1.4 gigahertz. And we know that FRBs jump around in frequency a lot as well. So what would be an advantage here is to have a lot of on sky time and also to have a huge uh, frequency coverage. So we started a, a monitoring campaign using Tarun, Onsala and Westerbork um, as part of a, a uh, during the out of session times, so when they weren't really being used, we uh, we were using these telescopes. And on this plot at the top here, I show the, the, the telescope name as a function of day, and this shows our observing campaign. This shows when we were observing and at what frequencies the colours correspond to frequencies. And we observed SGR 1935 for a total of 523 hours of non-overlapping time. Um, and we detected two bursts in these hundreds of hours of observations. Uh, we detected both of these bursts with Westerbork, and they're separated by only 1.4 seconds, which is about 0.4 of the rotational phase of the magnetar. Um, so this is the frequency time dynamic spectrum in the profile with linear red, circular and blue, and the polarization position angle at the top. Uh, these bursts were very bright, 110 Jansky milliseconds and 25 Jansky milliseconds. Uh, this is three orders of magnitude brighter than the fast burst and three orders of magnitude weaker than the bright uh, chime and stair burst. Uh, so back to this plot, uh, the pink region now shows uh, the events from SGR 1935. You see the very weak fast burst and the very bright Chime FRB stair 2 burst. And B1 and B2 are the two bursts that we detected with uh, Westerbork. And you see that, that the, um, the span is seven orders of magnitude and luminosity. To further uh, the talk about this, I guess, uh, the detected bursts per observing time, which is some kind of rate as a function of luminosity. You can see that fast is shown in blue, black are the Westerbork bursts, 
Stair is green and Chime is orange. And then uh, each of these regions, so the green region are the pulsars and rotating radio transients. The orange region is the giant pulses from pulsars and the pur purple region is the FRBs. And you see that these bursts don't fit nicely into one of these categories. Um, they actually, they span yeah, seven orders of magnitude in luminosity, but they only span two to three orders of magnitude uh, in the rate. So it's, the question at this point is, if we're calling the, the uh, stair two and chime burst a uh, galactic FRB, at what point do we stop calling it a fast radio burst? Uh, are all of these bursts produced by the same physical process or uh, are there many different physical processes going on to produce uh, radio emission from this magnetar? Uh, but now, now we, uh, we have a galactic analog to FRB. So we've seen uh, a bright burst from a magnetar that's comparable to FRB luminosities. Um, this supports the idea that um, at least some fraction of FRBs originate from extragalactic magnetars. And if this is the case, then um, there is a heated debate about how magnetars can produce this emission. So there are many different flavors of FRB magnetar progenitor models. Uh, I'm splitting into two broad categories here. Uh, one is magnetospheric, where the FRB emission originates within the magnetosphere of uh, a magnetar or a neutron star. And then non-magnetospheric, uh, the case where it originates, that the emission originates much farther from the, the magnetar neutron star. Um, for example, uh, the magnetar flares, it creates a shock, the shock propagates into the material, interacts with the material and creates a, a flare. So the question is, uh, how can we distinguish between magnetospheric and non-magnetospheric models? And so that brings me nicely into my third advantage to using the EVN for FRB science, and that's high precision characterization. So earlier I mentioned that we use uh, SFXC, the, the software for EVN correlation, uh, to produce data from the single dish to use for both burst searching and also to um, study the bursts in more detail uh, when we find bursts. So these are the, the four bursts I showed earlier that we used to localize FRB 180916. Uh, so burst one, burst two, burst three, and burst four. Um, and using the, the Effelsberg raw voltage data, we could um, generate data at very high time resolution and also with the full polarization properties in order to study uh, these four bursts in very high detail. As you can see, the um, burst three and burst four show very interesting time structure. Burst four is by far the brightest burst in our sample, um, but burst three shows these very interesting spikes uh, indicated by the orange and the purple markers. So I'm gonna start there um, and talk about burst three. Uh, so this, this plot is at 64 microsecond time resolution. So it looks like there's spikes that are about one bin wide uh, at 64 microsecond resolution. If we increase the time resolution to 16 microseconds, we can still see both of these components, uh, the orange and the purple component, but the purple component has divided into two subcomponents. And then if we jump again to one microsecond resolution, again, we can see both of the components, although it's hard to see on this, uh, in this range. So if we look at the zoom in, you can see that the purple component is still uh, the two components that are um, yeah, tens of microseconds wide. And panel I shows the orange component, which appears from 16 microseconds to one microsecond to have been split into two components here. Um, and these are about three to four microseconds wide. Um, so this is very constraining for the size of the emitting region. Um, but I'll talk about that in, in a few slides. We also studied the polarization properties of the bursts. Um, we find that the four bursts are highly linearly polarized, that they show no sign of circular polarization, and they have a constant polarization position angle um, during the bursts and also between bursts. Now, this is uh, very similar to what we see for 121102, actually. Um, these polarization properties are also seen for 121102, the, the first repeating FRB. Um, and in general, the FRB uh, population seems to show a very diverse set of polarization properties. Um, so this is in itself interesting that maybe repeating FRBs are starting to show this characteristic polarization picture um, that's in contrast with, with uh, other FRBs. 
Um, but specifically, I want to talk about here, this is burst before the brightest burst. And um, I've highlighted with this pink marker the, uh, the bright component of burst before. And we zoom in on that at one microsecond resolution. Um, we can see that the black uh, is the total intensity uh, burst profile. The red is a linear polarization profile and the blue is the circular polarization profile. And on the top is the polarization position angle. So I mentioned that we, we find that the position angle is constant during and between bursts. But when we go to this high time resolution, we actually see very small variations across the profile of the PA. Uh, and this is a few degrees. So to, to kind of summarize the, the characteristics that, that uh, we found in these bursts, we see time structure down to three to four microseconds. Um, this constrains the emission, uh, the size of the emission region to about a kilometer if we ignore relativistic effects. Um, this is really hard to explain in the non-magnetospheric model case because uh, if you, well, if you imagine the shock model that I described a few slides ago, um, you would have to have a very specific part of the shock uh, dominate the emission at a given time. You can incorporate this by introducing clumpiness in the material around the, around the magnetar neutron star. We also see a range of timescales. So we start at three to four microseconds and we go up to a few milliseconds. So that's about three orders of magnitude um, range of timescales. And if the, emission, if the emission is a relativistic outflow originating very close to the magnetar, you can expect, expect fluctuations of about microsecond, tens of microseconds. But if it originates much farther out, you expect these fluctuations to have been washed out. So again, um, the non-magnetospheric model is not so supportive of this idea. Um, we find that the polarimetric properties are consistent with 12102. Um, both the magnetospheric and non-magnetospheric uh, um, agree with this. And finally, uh, we see these small variations in the position angle uh, across, across the bright burst component of B4. Um, this, uh, the magnetospheric case predicts small variations and the non-magnetospheric case, again, it can be accommodated by clumpiness in the material around, but it's hard to, uh, to get this in that, in that model. And so these observational qualities we, we find are most naturally explained in the magnetospheric model. But there is one uh, minor thing that I have not mentioned yet that we have to incorporate. And that is that 180916 is periodic in its activity. And what I mean by that is that um, there is a five day window where it is on and it is active and it produces burst. And then there is the 11 days afterwards where it is off. It doesn't produce any bursts. Um, and there are uh, uh, a few um, uh, proposed explanations for why 180916 is periodic. Um, they include uh, just a long rotational period of 16.35 days, um, a processing neutron star, although the, the constraints on the position angle that we present um, above are uh, quite constraining for the, for the precession model, um, or it's in a binary system. Um, so I'm going to bring back the, the Hubble image that I showed earlier. It's possible that in the case of, of 180916, we actually have more of a run-of-the-mill neutron star as opposed to a highly magnetized magnetar um, that's in a binary system with a companion star. Um, so I'm going to talk about a little bit about high-mass X-ray binaries, which is a neutron star in an orbit with a massive star. Um, and there's been studies of, of these, and they're typically found close to, um, but with an average offset from uh, nearby star forming regions. And as, as we showed in the Hubble image, 180916 is offset from the star forming region. Um, so the, the fact that we have this activity period, which could come in the orbit, uh, the offset from the star forming region, and even the lack of persistent radio source uh, here, this is all consistent with the idea that 180916 is a high mass X-ray binary system. Um, with the Hubble image, we're actually able to place constraints on uh, the presence of a star, um, a companion star, and we, we can rule out the presence of an O-type star based on this, uh, this data, but we can't exclude something like a BE companion, uh, something less massive. Um, and in this picture, uh, you're, you might be wondering how we can get FRBs. Um, so the, the production of FRBs can come from the interaction of the neutron star's magnetic field and uh, the ionized wind of the, the companion star um, where they interact and there's magnetic reconnection and it creates these, uh, these flares. Um, so I'll briefly talk about this cosmic comb model by Aoka and Zhang. 
um, where you have the, the neutron star, you have a stellar companion, and you have the wind of the companion. Uh, and the, the wind of the companion compresses the magnetosphere of the neutron star on the side of the companion, and it creates this sort of tail, uh, which looks like a goose, and it's really hard to unsee if, you, uh, if, you, if you've noticed it. <laughs> um, and yeah, so it creates this tail of emission, and you can imagine that the periodicity is specific to the geometry of the system in the sense that we only see the bursts when this tail is pointed towards us. Um, so it's pointed towards us for five days and we see five days worth of bursts. One thing to note is that SGR 1935 is not in a binary system, it is an isolated magnetar. Um, so could it be that 1935 is more like a non-repeating FRB? Um, clearly there is a lot that we still can learn about FRBs and there's a lot of unanswered questions. Um, and I hope I've convinced you that the EVN is a great tool for studying FRBs uh, in very high detail. Uh, so that leads to my conclusions. Uh, what can the EVN do for FRB science? Uh, high precision localization to study the host galaxy and the local environment. Uh, we can do high cadence monitoring using the, the dishes out of session to study very rare sources. And uh, high precision characterization to study the burst properties in detail uh, and trying to distinguish between progenitor theories. Uh, the QR codes that I show here are of the, of the papers that I spoke about today in this talk. Um, and if you are an EVN station owner and want to participate in some of this, uh, some of these efforts, then please get in touch. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Kenzie, for that wonderful talk. Um, we've got some questions that have come in and I invite others to, to send in more as well. Um, one is, why did it take so long to detect FRBs? For example, pulsars were discovered long before. Yeah, uh, I think it's the... Uh, the search techniques. So um, specifically for, for pulsars, you're doing this folding, you're trying to uh, fold the data to find uh, a spike in the period, whereas FRBs are just single bursts. Uh, so you have to look at specifically at the time series and search for these single bursts. Um, so in the in the case of the, the Lorimer burst, they were looking at pulsar data and probably looking at a single burst from a pulsar. Um, in order to identify this single single burst that wasn't actually related to the pulsar that they were looking at. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. Can you say a little bit more, just a little bit more about how FRBs could be used to help solve the missing baryons problem? Uh, yeah, so it's definitely not my area of expertise. Um, so there's a, the paper that I mentioned is McCart et al. Um, and what they did, and what they did here is that they have uh, a sample of, I think maybe 10 uh, FRBs and um, uh, they have the, the dispersion measure of the um, of these 10 FRBs and they have the redshifts of these 10 FRBs. And essentially with that, with that information, the, the dispersion measure, as I explained, is like um, the signal interacting with electrons and with, with uh, yeah, the material in our line of sight. So um, this dispersion measure can also interact with the, or the, the signal will interact with the baryons. Um, and so then you can uh, map the content of the baryons in the universe using the same method and uh, yeah, account for these, these missing baryons in an independent way from the other, the other experiments. Uh, but yeah, I would encourage you to read this paper. Uh, it's certainly not my area of expertise. Thank you. Um, another question about the radio and X-ray luminosities of magnetar bursts. Are they related to each other? Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? Yes. Are radio and X-ray luminosities of magnetar bursts related to each other? Uh, okay. so, so in the case of the uh, SGR-1935, the, they've concluded that this burst, this radio burst, uh, hang on until I get to it. Uh, yeah, this radio burst and the X-ray burst are related based on the fact that they occur at the same time. And also that they both have these um, these spikes that are quite close in time. There is a, an offset, but there's there might be some uh, relativistic correction that's not been applied here. Um, and in the case for uh, the burst that we saw, we, did, we also searched for X-ray emission. Um, but we didn't see anything at the times of the bursts. But given uh, the ratio, so you can look at the ratio of radio to X-ray, um, and given that ratio, we wouldn't have seen anything with, with the, the instruments that we had on source. Um, 
at that time. So it's not surprising we didn't see anything, um, although it's it's quite surprising that there was no X-ray emission associated with with this particular burst uh, from FAST, uh, because I think I think in in uh, this uh, Marigetti et al. paper they predict that um, uh, given that they they had the instrument on source at the time of the fast burst. And so uh, if they, the fact that they didn't see anything actually meant that the, the ratio of radio to um, X-ray was, I think, six orders of magnitude less than what was uh, measured in this case in the bright burst. And so it, it's potentially that these kind of like brighter bursts or FRB-like bursts are have an X-ray counterpart and the weaker bursts don't. And that may be something to do with the physical mechanism, maybe. Okay, thank you. Um, another question that came in from our YouTube channel. Um, are FRBs beamed or isotropic? Uh, I think it, they have to be uh, beamed. And this is just based on uh, the amount of energy. Um, yeah, beamed. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, do you have a limited data buffer for your EVN observations? In other uh, words, how fast do you have to do the burst search using the single dish data? No, so we store all the data um, and yeah, we, we try and search it as, as quick as possible and, and save, especially with, in the case of the SGR 1935, we had 500 hours. Um, so it was kind of, a, it had to be kind of a quick turnaround in order to not fill up the, um, the storage. But yeah, we store all the data um, and then it's just a case of if we can store it, then we keep it and we, we filter out as more data comes in. Okay, thank you. Um, if these objects have to be in a binary system, would periodic F FRBs be an exception? Um, would, would periodic FRBs be an exception if they're in a binary system? Yeah. Um, I'm not entirely sure I understand the question, but in the case of, so I spoke about two repeating FRBs in this, uh, in this talk, so 1809, uh, 1809-16, which is known to have this 16.35 day period. Um, FRB 12.11.02, the first uh, repeater, also is known to have about 150, 160 day period. Uh, so potentially they're both in binary systems. Um, but I, I guess there's the, the other repeating FRBs haven't really been studied to such detail. Uh, so it's hard to say if, if they're in binary systems or not. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, when we get to the era of having hundreds of discovered FRBs, what is the observing strategy of the EVN to optimize the time it spends studying them? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I think when, when we have, if, if you mean hundreds of, of uh, FRBs localized, um, I think it's still the point I, I was trying to make in terms of uh, the difference between localizing to a host galaxy and studying the local environment. Um, if, if you mean hundreds that are studied so that we know the local environment, then, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure what the, what the strategy would be. I think at that point, we'll probably have a good idea of the kind of, uh, host galaxies that they live in. And, um, uh, yeah, if there's, if there's different populations and so the, the, the science will have to follow more, uh, yeah, maybe down the route of uh, explaining the periodicity, so, so studying the burst properties um, in detail or studying the burst properties as a function of time or as a function of phase, um, uh, all of these kind of things, we might move into that regime once, uh, yeah, once the, the localization questions have been answered. Okay. Um, another question, how sure can we be that any FRB is really non-repeating? What's the longest waiting time detected for repeating FRBs? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a good point as well. Um, I think it, at least in the beginning when there wasn't that many sources, um, there was a lot of telescope time dedicated to following up uh, uh, non-repeating FRBs. Um, and I, I'm not sure what the, the longest observation uh, time has been, but I assume hundreds of hours and never seen a, a repeated burst. But the problem is we don't understand the activity. Um, so there's some some of these repeaters that Chime have detected, they've seen two bursts from them um, and never again. So uh, that's not that different from only seeing one burst. So it's really, it's hard to uh, yeah decide if 
if it's a non-repeater and we're starting to think of more interesting ways to identify repeaters. Um, for example, there's, uh, well, I mentioned the polarization properties, maybe that, that will be a, a telltale sign of a repeater uh, repeating FRB. There's also, um, uh, it's called the sad trombone effect where uh, the bursts seem to be, uh, they drift downwards in frequency. We think this might also be a repeating FRB characteristic and actually uh, 190711, which was the third repeater that's been localized uh, there's only two bursts from that source, and the first one showed this downward drifting uh, uh, frequency structure. Um, and based on that, I think there was a lot of people that thought this is probably a repeater. And in fact, they followed up and, and it did repeat. So, uh, yeah, we have to come up with different ways to kind of identify repeaters. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Yeah. Okay. And um, maybe our last question. Um, before we end, how long do you think we'll have to wait until we detect a galactic FRB magnetar? Do you have an idea what's the rough probability of detecting such a source? Uh, well, I think there's a lot of people that think that this, uh, the burst from the SGR 1935 is the, the galactic magnetar. Um, and there is instruments, so STAIR 2 that I mentioned, that, that was built in mind of detecting uh, galactic uh, FRBs. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not sure what, what the likelihood of getting something that's three, four, five orders of magnitude brighter than the SGR burst. Um, yeah, it might be tens, hundreds of years. I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Kenzie, for an excellent talk. Thank you for all your questions. And thank you as well to everybody who came to participate. Um, our next uh, seminar will be in about two months time and we'll get information about that out to you as soon as we can.